we're on the second part of our discussion about Islam and modernity. Uh, before we get started, let's introduce you guys again. Do you want to go first? Uh, my name is uh, Imam Muhammad Tawhidi. I am a uh, reformist ordained scholar and I spent uh, nearly 12 years of my life studying Islam in the Middle East. Uh, a third generation Muslim Imam and I travel the world. I'm very involved in interfaith diplomacy and uh, I do have uh, reformist ideas that I like to uh, discuss. I've just released a book, The Tragedy of Islam, and I'm in New York uh, with the brother Daniel and brother Armin discussing whether or not Islam poses a threat to modernity. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. My name is Daniel Hayagachu. I'm a speaker, uh, lecturer, and researcher on Islam and modernity. I did my undergraduate degree at Harvard University where I studied uh, physics and double majored in philosophy as well. And I uh, pursued graduate studies in, in philosophy, studying Western philosophy, uh, Islamic philosophy. Um, I've spent the last 10 years uh, discussing, debating, teaching on uh, the challenge that modernity poses to Islam and how Islam responds to that challenge in a way that is authentic to the tradition of Islam, the long history, Sunni tradition of Islam of 1400 years, and how that response is compelling rationally and morally. Um, and, and I speak to both Muslims and non-Muslims. That's good. So before we start, just, just I want to mention that because we have a lot of other topics to touch on, I'm going to time out ourselves, uh, us discussing each one of these topics because we need to like stay on point and finish each one of these topics or else there's going to be a lot of things that we're not going to touch on. But before we, before I go through the points that both of you mentioned that we want to bring up, there was something that we left off from the part one that you wanted to make sure that we address. But let's, let's just give it like five minutes and then we'll move on. Uh, to begin with, we left off last session where I asked uh, Brother Daniel a question regarding his belief that uh, the problems with Islam and uh, I uh, mentioned ISIS so we're speaking about Islamic extremism modern Islamic extremism uh, whether or not this was a result of uh, intervention foreign intervention into Muslim land and that Western powers form policies that allow their military to intervene in the Middle East and fight Western wars in the Middle East. And uh, I uh, did not agree with that. I disagreed by saying that, in fact, uh, the American government, the former American government, financing ISIS, financing uh, Islamist rebels, financing Al-Qaeda, uh, this does not really create Islamic extremism, this only revives what is already there. The ideology of ISIS existed from the very early years of Islam. And I quoted, uh, sorry, I referred to an incident that explains the beheadings of ISIS, uh, which took place under the Caliph uh, of Islam, the first Caliph Abu Bakr, and he is the father-in-law of uh, our Prophet Muhammad. And uh, Abu Bakr clearly in Al-Bukhari, uh, because the brother requested uh, evidence from me, in Al-Bukhari an incident is very clear that after the death of uh, Prophet Muhammad, uh, Abu Bakr made it a obligatory act, and this is in the, the chapter of Zakat, made it an obligatory act for everyone uh, to pay Zakat, to pay charity to the Caliph. And uh, this is uh, in uh, Al-Bukhari, the obligatory charity tax, zakat. And this is hadith number 1399 to 1400. Now, when we take a look at, for example, uh, Abu Bakr saying, Abu Bakr said, by Allah, I will fight those who differentiate between prayer and zakat. Zakat meaning the charity. Uh, zakat is the compulsory right to be uh, taken from the property of regular Muslims. And if they refuse to pay, uh, even a she kid, which they used to pay at the time of the, the message of Allah, I will fight them for it. And then he did. He fought, for example, if you take a look at the Ridda Wars, the Wars of Apostasy. We have an entire book called uh, the Ridda Wars. Uh, I will 
quote the references in English. Kitab uh, al-Ridda by al-Waqidi, 1990, uh, printed, page 107 to 108. And then we have a huge uh, amount of references, which I, I can send to you and to the viewers. We can link them. And uh, I'm keeping my eye on, on the time. So this incident took place. What took place was Abu Bakr wanted the Muslims to take uh, tax. The Muslims did not wish to pay tax. Some of who did not believe in his, his caliphate, which the Muslims believe the Prophet had appointed who said after me is Abu Bakr. So it's all divine. The prophecy of Muhammad was divine. The appointment of Abu Bakr according to mainstream Islam was divine. This divine appointed caliph by the words of the Prophet that the Quran says does not utter from his own self. It is only the words of Allah. This appointed caliph and also the father-in-law of Muhammad went and ordered Khalid ibn al-Walid to kill a man called Malik ibn Wayra. And they killed him. And they raped his wife in the same night. And they cooked his head. And it's all quoted. I have right here Islamic sources, evidences. Where in Bukhari all of they cooked? I did not say, I said, Kitab uh, al-Waqidi, these are major, gigantic sources in Islam. If Where you want to cooked? reject them, you can reject. I'll, I'll show you. Let's just focus on what we agree on. No. Because uh, they the cooked the head. Let's let, let finish about. five and then My you time. have five. Yeah. They cooked the head and they raped his wife. And while you're speaking, I'm going to bring them out again. These are more than just one references. This is an agreed upon. In fact, even Umar ibn al-Khattab wanted to kill him for doing that. Do you disagree that Umar wanted to do that? He will start in five when, when your time is The started. point is, in my last 30 seconds, the point is, this is not one incident. We can ignore this. What about all the others? They killed them beheaded. You cannot separate between Islam, which is this, and what the people do. Abu Bakr and the Prophet are not just any people for you to say they don't represent Islam. So before I start your time, uh, can you also maybe tie this into saying whether Islam endorses violence and that's justified I mean, as well? That's a very big that's a, topic. You want to have a separate five minutes for okay, that. Okay, so separate five, five First minutes. First of all, so I'm going to talk about uh, this incident that you described. Um, what I denied was not what you described uh, from Sahih Bukhari. Okay. Um, First of all, ISIS has been denounced by Muslims around the world. All scholars among across sects, Shia, Sunni, they have all denounced ISIS. The only uh, and have denounced ISIS's claim to be following Islam correctly. Only white supremacists, white nationalists, Islamophobes, and apparently Imam Tawhidi think that ISIS has some kind of uh, normative connection with Islam. So that's point number one. Point number two, yes, uh, Khalid ibn Walid, uh, a great general, the greatest general in Muslim history and also in world history, um, did kill Malik ibn Nuwayra. And uh, he did this for reasons that he had in this time of the instability and war. And it was not Omar, Omar, five minutes. Omar, peace be upon him, may God be pleased with him, disputed um, his decision making on killing this particular figure, and so that it's possible for caliphs uh, and, and the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, to disagree and for them to make mistakes. There's no question about that. As for rape, I mean, this is a very inflammatory thing that you're saying. Cooking his head, this is all Shia sources no. who are... Sunni sources. Who, no, they're don't not lie. Sunni sources. Okay, no, I'm not lying. We have to let Please him. don't Sunni interrupt. Sunni sources. Don't, let him, let him yes, don't interrupt. I've only spoken for a don't minute and a half and you're already interrupted. Yeah. Don't accuse me of lying. Yeah, I am accusing don't you of being represented. Don't say Shia sources. No, no, I am we agree, we agree we're going to do this for But don't say Shia sources because that makes me a liar. Did I interrupt you and call you a liar in the middle of I didn't. I didn't insult you either. I did not insult you by saying Shia sources. I just said it wasn't in Sunni sources. So... It is in You're calling sources. me a liar by saying guys, it. Guys, it is in guys, Sunni sources. Okay, guys. It is in Sunni sources. Guys, no, let, let, 
yes. Let move him... on. Don't say Shia sources. You no, say Shia means I'm a liar. There's a disagreement. He's not saying you're lying. Right. Sunni talk, source. Let's okay, you did not talk. establish that it was in Sunni oh, sources. Let's, 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 let him finish it. You, let him you finish read the hadith from Sahih Bukhari. Bukhari. We have so many things we need to touch on. Continue, continue, continue. Continue. No, let's not interrupt. Okay, let's not interrupt each other. Even, even if the worst. Even if even if the other says the worst thing, continue, okay, good. Continue. All right. So th this is something that's not in Sahih uh, sources, Sunni sources, and even the Shia sources. I have to go look. I'm not an expert in Shia Islam to be able to judge that. Uh, but it wouldn't be surprising if there were these kinds of polemics against uh, the Sunni caliphs. But the, I don't disagree that Khalid ibn Walid did kill this individual. And Abu Bakr uh, was approving of this, and Omar disagreed with this. Khalid ibn Walid did go on to marry um, the, uh, the wife of that person that he killed. And this was seen as by Omar, and he expressed this as something that shouldn't have been done. Um, so yeah, there can be disagreements amongst the companions of the Prophet, and this is something that's recognized and acknowledged within uh, Sunni theology. Um, again, this is a you mentioned the Ridda Wars. This is a time of extreme political unrest uh, within the history of Islam. And Khalid ibn Walid uh, made choices that and decisions that he needed to make within that context. And he was supported by the first caliph and the second caliph who succeeded Abu Bakr um, uh, disagreed with his methodology. And that's fine. There's nothing that's wrong with that. We see those kinds of uh, decisions being made in wartime scenarios within every uh, tradition and community and culture to point to this and say that this is uh, the reason why we have ISIS. I mean, that's preposterous. That's uh, all Muslims are reading these same sources. Uh, I'm not going around and uh, killing people and beheading them uh, for no reason. So this is just inflammatory. You're repeating uh, the kinds of statements that we find from Islamophobes and white supremacists, okay, which you seem to have an affiliation with. So. Okay, okay. Guys, uh, we, we need to move on to different topics. No, I'm going to stick on this because I need to prove that I'm not a liar. Do you want to stick on this topic or do you want to move on? I, have to I didn't on. come here to debate the details. What of I suggest we do, I have make a suggestion myself. Polemics. I want to prove that I'm not a liar. Okay. Is this time over? Okay, well, okay, five. Five minute response, and then after this, we'll move, move to on. any topic. How can we move on if I can't huh. respond to him calling me a liar? But okay. then, but then it will be forever. Is, we, no, guys, said, we can. Okay, guys, guys, we have to. You have to. We are, you have can, other. We have other. Ways. We have other. They told me uh, supremacist affiliated how with supremacists, white supremacists. How about this? Let me respond. We can talk about that. Let's talk about white supremacy. No, let's, let's talk about respond. Islamophobia. Let's, let's talk about colonialism. Right. Okay, how about this? Why don't you let me respond? How about this? How about this? Why won't you let me speak? I'm going to do that. I'm going to. Five minutes and then five minute response and then we'll move away from this. Yes. Okay? Okay. Five minutes and then five minutes you respond, then we'll move away. Different topic, okay? Got it. Tariq al-Tabari. One of the, if not the most authentic Islamic source on history. Volume 10, The Conquest of Arabia, page 104. Tariq al-Tabari. Take it out on your phone and you can follow up with it from Sunni sources. Giant Sunni theologian historian says Khalid ibn al-Walid used to excuse himself from killing Malik on the grounds that Malik had said when he was interrogating him, I think your companion was only saying such and such. Khalid said, and why didn't you reckon him a companion of yours? Then he made him come forward and struck off his head. Who? Khalid ibn al-Walid and those of his companions. Then, when Omar ibn al-Khattab learned of the, their murder, he spoke of it with Abu Bakr the Caliph repeatedly, saying the enemy of God has done what? Has become an apostate, who? Malik, against a Muslim man, killing him, and then leaping upon his wife, not waiting and then ending up to marry her like you said. He cut off his head and he leaped upon his wife and he killed her. This is one part of the incident from Tariq al-Tabari. I will bring more sources. He, no, he, wait, wait, he raped her. Sorry, he raped her. He killed Malik and he raped his wife. This is what the Arabic sources say. He raped her. And even if he wanted to marry her, he has to wait four months and ten days for the blood cycle. You know the Islamic ruling. Do not lie. Let's not accuse each other of lying. And Maybe this man, you just praised this man. You just praised him. 
the greatest general. Did, did he not praise him? You praise this terrorist. Okay, so he, he can respond now? Respond whatever you want to say. Okay, re respond and then after this we're moving to a different topic, okay? Alright, so number one, you read a translation. It's exact, the, uh, certified, no. don't lie. Okay, let's wait. Certified no, translation. No, 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 no. Let's not You interrupt. are making lies. Oh no, my no, God. Look, look, certified look, from your if books. If I can speak, I can uh, clarify why. Don't lie. Do not defend terrorists. Okay. Tabari, okay. let him speak. This, for is, a, this is a let known point. Of this, I'm not disagreeing that Khalid ibn Walid uh, killed this person. Good. That's not where the disagreement. I not, I'm not disagreeing that this was a beheading. Okay. I'm not disagreeing with those historical facts. To say that he raped him, that's a point of Shia Sunni dis divergence and disagreement. It's not because Shia Sunni. No, let, let, it's let, not Shia let, Sunni. let him finish. He's fooling you. Let him it's not Shia Sunni. They're Sunni between themselves killing each other. Let him finish. This is his time now. Finish. Yeah, I mean, I think that we can talk about this in a very calm way. We don't need to get upset. Uh, of course, this is you, something you're praising a terrorist. Let him finish. Let him finish. Let him finish. Let him finish. Uh, yeah, I mean Khalid ibn Walid. I named my, one of my sons after Khalid yeah, ibn Walid. Yeah, good luck to your yeah. son. Should so anyway, this is uh, something that is a point of disagreement uh, between Shias and Sunnis. In their polemics, Shia accuse Khalid ibn Walid of just uh, not going through the waiting period before marrying um, his his wife. Sunnis maintain that no, he made, he waited. Uh, through the waiting period no, they did not. before uh, finish, marrying. So it wasn't a rape. It was okay. a rape. He lived on his wife. You say he lived yeah, Tariq so Tabari. This is just Shia oh, Please. Oh, Tabari is Shia. Come on. Tabari, Tabari. Tabari sorts, uh, cites from many different sources. It doesn't mean that's authentic. It, it's not certified it's by the Sunni. If you want to find narrations in Tabari, okay, guys. yes, we Tabari need to, is, we need to have is some a Sunni Muslim, but right. he cites from many different sources All right, this, without that necessarily being we're authentic. Ending this, it's we're, a ending point this, of we're ending this topic. We're moving to the next one. We're, in, we're moving to the next so one. How is through your teeth. How is that fair that he gets to speak for no, five minutes for two uninterrupted? Minutes. Lie through your teeth. I didn't interrupt his two minutes. Are you finished? Are you not? Okay, two more. Two more minutes. Yeah, so. take from Shia sources. Yeah. Get so. out of here. Let him. Let him. Wait. Baba, start a new topic. He named his son after a terrorist. Science, start, start Do you topic. have anything else to add? Yeah, I mean, this is many Muslims name their children Khalid. Yeah. Um, this is a very common name, and he's a respected uh, he's a terrorist. Can I? And um, he's a terrorist. You know, very strong Muslim guy. leader, and he's recognized within Western history as well. No, he's the not. most successful. General, he's not successful. Uh, within, he's a successful uh, terrorist. Uh, Muslim you history. You have to let him finish his, the time. But he's lying at you. I mean, yeah, yeah but I, but he's lying to you. This, this is the way, point. This is the you. way that someone. You're will. not even out, outraged. You're not outraged. He's telling you this, is how this I guy. Do. He's praising a guy who's a terrorist who butchered people. The way, if the way we can understand other people, even if we don't agree with them, is by listening to them. We can't just yell at them and get them. To I'm not yelling. Them. Well, I am yelling. I'm frustrated, but I'm not angry. I'm frustrated that he would I can't. he would justify. How can you justify? I don't understand. Don't give me your Harvard. Into, into, you can never intellectually justify the fact that someone doesn't want to give you money. You go and you behead them and you take their wife, whether it be a waiting period of 10 years or 10 days. You can never justify that. You are putting such a Accusation. polemical frame of it. Oh, that, it's oh all he, wouldn't, he wouldn't oh, give no, no, Khalid no, no. ibn Walid oh. personal money? No, no. He was, right. This was something oh. that was to Next maintain the angels. cohesion and one, the unity one thing, one of the, the, one thing, the new angels. Muslim state. And, and, and the, right. so they made right. Cut it out, cut it out. Okay, cut it out. Then one thing we can do at the end is that if you have any written statement that in response to this that you want to add, I'll put it in the description of this video, no, okay? No, 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 no. Okay. Um, let's, I'm going to ask one a question. Can Islam be reformed? Uh, who wants to go first? Do you want to go first? I'm going to go first since he's the reformist. Uh, Islam will never be reformed. All right. To begin with. Okay. Uh, Islam will never ever be reformed because I simply believe that reformation of a religion is man-made and Muslims, whether it be because of their culture or whether it be because of the traditional uh, teachings or the atmosphere that they've grown up in, we have a united understanding that we can never accept what is not from God. So religion has to be from God. Religion can never be man-made and at the same time be accepted by the Muslims. So a reformation is basically introducing something that is man-made and trying to uh, present it as though it's a, it's a religion or a belief system that exists, whereby it doesn't. 
so what do I believe in? I believe that Muslim individuals can liberate themselves from terrorist teachings and extremist fundamentalist ideologies uh, such as praising terrorists uh, uh, such as this and naming their children after terrorists. Okay, let's not go back to no, that. No, I'm not going back. But this is a good way to move forward. So this is how a Muslim can basically liberate his mind and liberate his family from corrupt teachings uh, which basically say uh, you can name your son after a terrorist or name your daughter after a terrorist. It doesn't work like this. There are terrorist females in, in, in Islamic history. Uh, so this is my stance on, on uh, Islamic Reformation. The current reform movements that we see today are all a scam. They present a form of Islam that does not exist. There is no Islam that agrees 100% with the Constitution. There is no, no such teaching that uh, came from Mecca that sits 100% with the laws of, of New York or the laws of America. Whether the American laws are 100% perfect or not, that's a different discussion. But we are speaking about an ideology and the current society that we have today. Is it compatible? It's not. Can there be a reformation? There can never be a reformation. Islam is not a religion that can be reformed. This is something we need to understand. Very simple. Why? One of the main factors why Islam cannot be reformed is because one, its reformation would be man-made. Secondly, there is no actual governing Islamic body that tells it where to go. So if the church wanted to go through a period of uh, reformation or enlightenment, they would have to take orders from a super supreme, superior re religious hierarchy uh, that directs them towards that direction. Islam doesn't have that. Islam has two major denominations and then over 70 schools of thought from within that. Each one of them does not see the other Muslim as a true Muslim. To begin with, this Muslim is not a real Muslim according to that Muslim. And according to most Muslims, the Ahmadiyya Muslims are not Muslims. So there will never be a reformation because there's no unity when it comes to understanding the religion and the needs of the religion and so on and so forth. Another matter which is very, very important is the funding of these reform movements. It's impossible for a Muslim community to say, yes, you know what, we are fundamentalists. Let us become open-minded and try to understand the other side. But who's funding the other side? Some Zionist businessman or a Republican donor. This will never work. Uh, a reformist movement needs to be uh, completely independent, whereby Muslims can find some, some uh, connection with the other people. Now, what do I believe in? Uh, I, I go around promoting the idea that every violent uh, ruling within Islam, such as beheading, such as stoning, does not exist in this current time. Did our ancestors do it? Yes, and they were terrorists. So what if they did it? Because my ancestor did it, it doesn't mean it's right. Because the, the companions of Prophet Muhammad did it, does not mean it's right. We have to turn around and condemn our bloody history, blood dripping history, and wake up and move forward. This capital punishment doesn't suit in, in this atmosphere. It doesn't suit in today's era. It never suited any era, but that was the language of the time. Now we can develop, and we have developed. It's only the extremists that doesn't want to develop. It's only them that want to continue uh, to butcher and kill people. Uh, so this is my belief system, that there will never be a reformation, but Muslims can find an ideology that they can still be Muslims, but reject terrorist figures and terrorist teachings from the history of Islam. Thank you. Okay, so he's going to talk now, but uh, let him speak throughout his five minutes. If you want to be able to respond to what he says, let him speak. Like the next question, he maybe maybe he could do it first. Okay. Yeah. So I think that what to say to that is interesting. How? But before you respond to that, can Islam be reformed? You need to answer the question as well at first. Can Islam be reformed? I mean, this is something that has already taken place. So, I mean, this is not, this is, the question is, is this reform correct? Uh, is it correct from an Islamic point of view? Is it morally correct? What kind of political implications are there? I mean, those are the real questions. There's already been many attempts to reform Islam. And as a traditional Muslim, Orthodox Muslim, I don't consider those efforts legitimate. I think that what uh, Tawhidi said that, uh, Imam Tawhidi said about reformism is a scam. I completely agree with that, which I find strange because he introduced himself as a reformist. 
So I don't know if he's calling himself a scam artist or not. Oh, let's not but let's not I mean, throw, this is, let's not, not, let's not thinking, throw subtle accusations at each other. Okay, like I'm like, just repeating the words that no, he but, but, mentioned. He, he's calling me a terrorist or a supporter of a terrorism no, because let's I named both, my son. Everybody, let's stop after doing Khalid that. ibn Walid. Everybody, so this is something that yes, both sides. I stop think, doing uh, that. Let's stop throwing. Okay, well, stop, let me finish yeah, my five minutes. Go. You keep interrupting. Sorry, I'll give you more time. Five to five minutes, ten seconds. Go on. Sorry. All right, so when we look at uh, the history of Islamic reform, we have to go back to the uh, beginning of the colonial period, uh, the beginning of the 19th century. We have to look at what was the motivation to want to reform Islam. And what we find are colonizers uh, with colonizing agents such as Lord Cromer within Egypt. Uh, we find the British in the uh, Asian subcontinent in India. We find them in Malaysia and Indonesia, and they all had the same goal as colonizers. We need to uh, get Muslims less committed to Islamic law, because if they're committed to Islamic law, they're not going to accept us as their rulers. They're not going to accept our law. They're not going to accept our companies and corporations, such as the East India Company, that's wanting to control them and take their resources and enslave them. And they're going to fight against us. They're going to engage in jihad, in defending their land and their families and their people against our imperial invasion. So we have to convince them that what we are doing as colonizers is helping them progress. So they need to understand that Islam is something that is open to reformation. It's open to becoming secularized and liberalized. And so they took deliberate measures to influence Muslims and to, in the words of Lord Cromer, de-Muslimize de -Muslimize Muslims. And they did this, for example, by bringing some of the uh, top intellectuals of the Muslim world, top scholars of the Muslim world, to England, to France, giving them a secular education, secularizing them, getting them acculturated to European, Western culture, and then sending them back into top positions at universities, at Islamic universities, had them establish their own universities, such uh, uh, Sayyid Ahmad Khan, for example, established his university within the subcontinent, and taking control of governmental positions, media positions, to pr tell Muslims not that we are here to destroy Islam, no, we're here just to bring a more enlightened Islam, to bring an Islam that is more peaceful, more tolerant. We're here just to help Muslims achieve the kind of progress that Europe has enjoyed. And so this is the history of reformism. It is something that is government funded. It is something that is pushed because uh, to this day. Uh, through the work of different NGOs around the Muslim world. And the goal has always been the same, to have Muslims denounce or separate themselves from those aspects of their religion that conflicts with the colonial en enterprise, with the influence of imperial law, to have them abandon those aspects of uh, their religion that conflicts with liberal secularism, feminism, and so forth. So this is a deliberate program. It has been uh, very successful, unfortunately. And we find different kind of uh, you know, native informants around the world who are sponsored by Western governments to present themselves. Look, I'm a Muslim. In fact, I'm a scholar. In fact, I'm an imam. And Muslims, we have a problem. Islam is a tragedy. We have to change Islam and make it more compatible with the modern progressive way of life. And we have to denounce our past and we have to burn and slash our tradition because there's, these are all terrorists. And we have to embrace the path of enlightenment, the path of progress that our Western masters are uh, presenting. So this is something that we find in the past. We find it today. Sometimes we find it in amongst ourselves. I really want to move to the next topic, but um, may I move to the next topic? May, may, wait, before I start, uh, may I move? Or if you respond, then he would have to give him. That would be another ten minutes. Do you do you want? Do no, you of want course to? I have to respond. Okay. Uh, but then, so let me let's have a plan. Then you're gonna respond, and then he's gonna respond, and I, then we we'll move. Don't mind. Okay. I don't mind. But then, uh, so firstly, okay. Um, um, firstly. With regards to 
the brother calling uh, or implying that whether or not I am a, a scam artist because I called the reform movement a scam. Uh, yes, I refer to myself as a reformist, but I mean, uh, I'm surprised that you don't know that uh, reform, reforming Islam has many meanings. Uh, and it's, it's, it's applied to many people with different agendas throughout the history of, of religions, and especially Islam, uh, which in this case we're talking about. Uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the Caliph of ISIS, considers himself a reformer. Uh, the uh, founder of Wahhabism considers himself, considered himself a reformer. Uh, in fact, uh, Prophet Muhammad considered himself a reformer when he came to uh, when he when when he came uh, to Mecca with his message, and he and Islam emerged. Islam emerged as a reformist uh, religion that told the, the men to stop burying their newborn uh, daughters. Uh, so for me to call myself a reformist, it does not mean that I'm a prophet and it does not mean that I'm like Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab. Neither does it mean that I'm part of any other reform movement. Uh, it's up to you before pointing fingers to understand what type of a reformist is this man? Is he someone that wants to revive what had existed before uh, Islam? The delusion that the, the Meccan Islam was somewhat more peaceful than the Medina Islam? What exactly does he want? Or is he a reformist that deals on matters that concern concerned today's way of life, which is exactly what I do. I couldn't care less about what, what happened in Mecca. I denounce it and I move on. Now, moving on to what, what he said about uh, uh, the, uh, the Lord that he mentioned and the, the, uh, the people who come to colonize Muslim worlds and uh, bring these influential uh, Muslims and take them to the West and then bring them back and, and, and uh, try to convince the people that live in the Muslim world that through universities and centers that we are here to bring you a more enlightened version of Islam. We are here to help you. We don't want to eradicate Islam. And, and then he referred to uh, other issues uh, previously of, of Islamophobia. Firstly, there is no Islamophobia and nobody is trying to destroy Islam. Uh, on, in fact, let me rephrase, nobody has destroyed Islam more than Muslims themselves. A day doesn't go by without Muslims killing themselves, murdering each other, butchering each other, issuing fatwas against each other. Muslims kill more Muslims than anybody has touched Muslims in history. Now, you always speak from the mentality that we are being oppressed and look at what the West is doing to us and uh, uh, someone uh, take a look at the evil doings of the... Yes, the West has evil people. The Westerners will tell you that we are ashamed of our history. They will tell you that we killed and we butchered. No problem. They will tell you. Nobody's denying that. You somehow crafted in a way as though the Muslims were all angels. As though we were all angels. Brother, you're, you're, are you Iranian if I may ask? You are Iranian. Your nation... I was born in the US, but yes, my parents are from Iran. Your, your heritage, you're Iranian. Your nation was converted into Islam by the sword. I'm not Iranian. I come from an Arabian lineage of the companions of Prophet Muhammad, Adi ibn Hatam al -Tai. He is my ancestor. Probably my ancestor came and took over your, your country. So why, why do you support terrorists that took over your heritage and you find me, of course I'm going to condemn my terrorists. So what's, what's wrong with, with me condemning dark history? What's wrong with that? So this is a question. Do not make it seem as though Muslims did, did nothing. They were all cool. How did these Malaysia, Indonesia, they all became Muslim by the sword. All of them became Muslim. All Islamic caliphates, all of the conquering, over 53 countries, all of the terrorist Islamic caliphates conquered and butchered. You're going to say conquests or someone else might say conquest. It's not conquest in, in the science of politics. It's invasion. You go and you rape and you kill and you take their riches and then you go back because they're Jews or because they're Christians. And then you want to, you want to somehow justify this through the, the laws of war. It doesn't happen like that. Uh, another issue is that um, uh, these people are making uh, uh, their Islam, uh, making Muslims less committed to Islam. There are more Muslims leaving Islam today than any, any other religion. And the brother in Atheist Republic can prove that to you. What ISIS has done will have more Muslims leave Islam than any uh, foreign agenda can do. And if you want to say, oh, ISIS doesn't represent Islam, ISIS represents the exact Islam that took place in Mecca. And we have names of people that were victims of that ideology. Thank you. Okay, so if... I'm, I'm going to give you five minutes, but if you don't want me to interrupt you, both of you, don't, don't make any subtle accusations, and that way there will be no interruptions, okay? What's wrong with that? He can accuse me of anything he wants. No, That's both fine. of you from now, I think, like, don't accuse each other of lying, scam artists, being terrorists. I no. think it's important to recognize the role that people play in current politics. 
I think that's a very well. You can't be sure, so don't accuse. Yeah, I'm not accusing. I, I'm just making so, very general statements. Yeah. If oh. it, hint, I mean, hint, okay. Let him say what he wants. Yeah. Okay. I, I think he, he can. He I has I a want. thick skin. I mean, he's heard it all. He's on Twitter. He knows okay. what Fine. what Five the minutes. deal is. If I say something, it's yeah. not gonna. I only me. get offended when you praise terrorists. This. No, I no this is getting started to. Okay. No. Five minutes. No. Okay. I mean, there's like a lot of things to discuss uh, that he's raised. He, he mentions going back to what existed before. We have to go back to what existed before. My question is, okay, well, how do you know what has existed before? Do you rely on texts? Do you rely on traditions? Do you rely on narrations that have been passed down uh, through an oral uh, tradition? Do you rely, because he's constantly denouncing all of the books among, of Sunnis. He's constantly denouncing the traditions of even the Shia. Um, so what, what's left? What kind of knowledge do you have about what happened before when you've completely cut yourself off by saying that these people are all terrorists? So I think this is a contradiction in uh, epistemology here. Uh, on the contention that Islam spread by the sword, you know, I'm not going to uh, try to deny that the influence of Islam was definitely spread through military conquest. And I mentioned Khalid ibn Walid, and how he was the, one of the greatest generals, the greatest general within uh, Islamic history. But there's this kind of understanding that violence is something that we have to uh, denounce and that we have to view religion as something that is, it's, that is violent in its essence. And this violence is what makes religion so dangerous. And I think that you as, as an atheist would agree with that kind of reasoning but i want to i don't think it's self-evident that violence in and of itself is something that we reject as a society absolutely not uh order in society the structure of governance of the nation state any government that has existed in pre-modernity or modernity is on the basis of violence is on the basis of law enforcement how can you enforce how can you coerce without violence police officers that are uh, walking and patrolling the streets are authorized to use violence to use force why because this is how you can maintain order and how you can maintain a legal regime so we don't have a problem with violence the problem is not with violence the problem is what is being uh, pushed and what is being uh, enforced through violence so we can have a debate on whether Islam is true or not. If you think that Islam is true, and you think that Islam is a true religion and it is from God, then you do want to spread this. You want this to reach all corners of the globe in the same way that a liberal person would think that uh, racism and anti-racism anti is something that must be defended through force or anti or, or sexism is something that has to be eradicated misogyny is something that has to be re uh, eradicated anti-semitism is something that has to be eradicated by force why because we have a legal regime that makes it uh that has high penalties for people who are racists who people people who are misogynists people who are violating these kinds of liberal norms and people don't have any problem with that kind of enforcement if i tell armin or i tell you that oh do you know that such and such society is uh, mistreating its women and is misogynistic and abusing its women shouldn't we do something about that shouldn't we go and change that society by force obviously they're not going to agree that society is not going to agree and say oh yeah sure just come into our country and reform and make us uh give up our misogynistic ways no you have to do that by force but you think that that's justified because this is something that you agree as a good you agree that this is something and i agree too that misogyny should be something that it should be eradicated uh, racism is something that should be eradicated. We, sh we should not have a to tolerance for racist, uh, white supremacist, anti-Semitic kind of hatred. No, there's no place for this. And if you believe in that and you agree with me, then you'll also agree that there should be force and, and laws that penalize those and hold people accountable and take away their livelihood or imprison them physically, imprison them. That's a form of violence for violating those kinds of norms. So Islam 
is the truth. Islam is the truth. And so as a Muslim, of course, I think that it should spread and that kind of law and legal regime should spread. Does that mean that in Islamic history, they went to people uh, with a sword and said, convert, otherwise we'll kill you? Yes. No, that didn't happen because the scholars have explicitly uh, said that that is not permissible. But as far as spreading Islam through military conquest, yeah, that's an undeniable part of uh, Muslim history. And that's something that is justifiable uh, in, in any kind of argument that we want to present. I, I really need to move on to the next topic. Okay, and this is going to be a question mostly addressed to the uh, mom. There's no response need to this, but then I'm going to ask a question that is mostly directly to you. Okay, so and I'm going to because it seems like we're not going to get to most a lot of the topic. I'm going to combine a few questions together. Okay. So um, you mentioned that the Quran is perfect, right? It seems like you have a lot of um, you Wait, I did not say the Quran. Okay, was so perfect. my question is, my here, I'll ask a yeah, question. Be okay. careful. So let I me, did not say the Quran was perfect. Okay, correct me if I'm wrong. Is the Quran perfect? What does Islam have to offer? What's good about Islam? Because I hear a lot of negative things about Islam that you mentioned. I want to see what what's good about Islam that you mentioned. And it seems, um, and also, is it true that most of your a critique for Islam focuses on the Sunni sources of Islam, and whenever you're asked to talk about your critiques for the Shia parts of Islam, you mention Khomeini or anything that has to do with the Vilayat Faqih, but are you endorsing Shiism, not the Vilayat Faqih version of Shiism, but other forms of Shiism, in, and, but just main, m your main target is Sunni Islam, is that the case? Um, and also, what is the Islam that you agree with and what why is it good and why are you a muslim sorry i know that was a lot of questions but if i don't ask them all together uh, then i don't think we're going to get to any okay yeah. um the first uh, question very simple uh is the is the quran uh, perfect uh, the answer is clearly no uh, simply because according to the sunni uh, teachings a goat and a sheep came and ate parts of it so it can't be perfect in the sense it could be good enough, but it's not perfect, according to my understanding. This is how I see the world. If a book had verses in it and a goat came and ate from it, it cannot be perfect anymore. And according to the Shia belief, uh, there are many things concerning uh, the family of Prophet Muhammad that are not, not included in the Quran. There are rights of people that have been uh, taken. Uh, from the Quran. So both m Muslim schools of thought, both denominations, don't have evidence uh, that the Quran is in fact the way it is perfect 100%. It is not. There are uh, verses in the Quran that Shias believe uh, are supposed to be in a different place, such as uh, parts in, in chapter 5. Uh, and there are also parts in ch chapter 33, uh, especially verse 33. Uh, many people uh, believe that these verses of purification should be somewhere else in order to give a different context. The point is, the Quran, how it is, uh, people can say all Muslim scholars agree. They don't all agree. Some of there are many books written about Tahrif al Quran, the distortion of the Quran, and it's been proven throughout history and that the Quran, one time a sheep eats it or a goat, and, and all, all this. So, to me, no, I don't believe so. Uh, secondly, uh, when it comes to uh, why I'm still a Muslim. You see, I, and I've answered this before in one of my interviews, uh, I do not believe, uh, and this is how I see life, I do not believe that religion is something you can leave and is something you can no longer be part of. Yes, a certain part of ideas might no longer seem convincing to you and you believe in another set of ideas. But I believe religion is actually part of the heritage of the human being. You can never run away. From, I can never run away from the fact that I come from a lineage that played a big role in the establishment of Islam. No matter to what religion I convert or whether, whether I leave it or not, I can never run away from that. It, it's part of who I am. It's part of me. It's part of my thinking. Uh, it's part of my being. I don't see religion as though it's something that is is on the side. No, it's it's a way of life, and and that's how it was produced to me. That's how I developed as a human being. Uh, therefore, I don't see it that way. And and you can I cannot change the laws that I believe in. Uh, are there figures in Islam that I completely adore and I love and I care about? Yes, there are figures such as Hussein, the grandson of Prophet Muhammad, who was butchered and massacred by the Muslims themselves, the caliphs themselves. 
uh, I love I love his his offspring. I love uh, many many Sunni uh, scholars in in modern times, such as Hassan Farhan Al Maliki. I adore good Muslims that wish to uh, you know make the world a better place. Your question: What can Muslims offer? Islam. What can Islam? Uh, so what can Islam offer? Islam can offer whatever other religions offered. What can other religions offer? Islam can also offer that. Islam is no different from Christianity or Judaism when it comes to offering. It can give its adherent security. It can form governments. It can do whatever other governments do. Whether or not these offerings are required is a different story. But Islam's uh, offering uh, is completely different from what Muslims can offer. And I believe what Muslims can offer is a great deal from art and music, everything. Take a look at our countries, Iran, uh, Dubai, become developed in 20, 25 years. Why? Because the door has been opened. Muslims can offer many things. The only thing is the Muslims are better than their, their ideology of fundamental Islamism. They are better than their ideology. If only we lift the, the, uh, the, uh, the chains of, of, of this uh, corrupt uh, teachings of theocracy. Islamic doctrine, what's, in, what's, what's something positive about the Islamic doctrine? Islamic, when it comes to doctrine, it's not a matter of positive or negative. It's an idea that could be right and could be wrong. Okay, we, last question I had, which you haven't answered. Is it true that you mostly focus on criticizing Sunni Islam? And when, we, when you're asked to criticize Shia Islam, you mostly only focus on Velayat Fatih? I criticize Islam uh, in the sense that I criticize extremist Islamism, militant Islamism, fundamentalist teachings of Islam that lead to beheading, stoning, killing, and so on and so forth. I have no problem with the, with the moderate Muslim and the peaceful Muslim who wishes to live his life peacefully. Now, I'll take a few more seconds because you interrupted me. Uh, I oppose all theocracies. I do not believe in a Shia Muslim government or a Sunni Muslim government. I am a reformist and sects are not relevant to me. I look at Islam as a religion as a whole. Another issue is I do not identify from part of, in being part of any sect. I was born a Muslim and this is the tragedy that we are living and I'm trying to do my best to fix it. Another issue is in my book, The Tragedy of Islam, I have included a complete chapter uh, dedicated to the difficulties of Shia Islam, which is the denomination uh, that I come from. Uh, this is basically it. I do not support sectarian uh, teachings at all, and I think they are irrelevant to my mission. Thank you. So five minutes and 40 seconds. So wait, before I start the time, I just, uh, you, we wanted to make sure you talk about how uh, the, you know, Islam, you see it as a cure, you see it as superior to modern values. Islam comes with violence, it comes with wife beating, it comes with slavery, it comes with child rights. Um, and I know each one of these are on, their own separate topic, but maybe you want to pick one of them and see how could you justify a, an ideology that endorses such teachings. Okay, so I can address all of those that you mentioned, but in five minutes, I mean, that's a really big challenge. To Which one of them? Maybe, maybe. So, yeah, I'll, I'll choose one. I already addressed violence. I think that that's something that, unless you're a pure pacifist, uh, it's hard to think how but, you can live in a modern society. Let's uh, go with be slavery, because you already addressed violence, I guess. Yeah, or I can address, I can address child brides, or I can, oh, any of those. But, um, I think that we have to understand that we are part of a very particular uh, social, political uh, context and structure that prevents us from understanding the practices not only of Muslims, but of all pre-modern societies and, and uh, social structures. So this is something that is not just an issue, like if you want to talk about child uh, marriage, if you want to talk about slavery, if you want to talk about uh, violence this is not something that is only affecting Muslims. In fact, this is an issue or these are uh, points of critique by the modern West for not just Muslims, but also Native Americans, First Nations, Aboriginals, traditional Chinese, traditional Hindus, traditional Africans. And it's been used this kind of accusation of barbarism to justify the invasion and imperialism and the attacks on all of these communities. And so we have to really understand the larger discourse and how this kind of language of saying, oh, Islam is barbaric, uh, has been used for all of these uh, communities that have been genocided.
Okay, and so we have to be cognizant of how this discourse plays into the current political actions that are taking place in the Muslim world and the threats from the West to invade and attack and kill and genocide Muslims uh, throughout the world. So that's, that's really the, the first point. Um, I think that what Islam can offer as a solution, you know, is, uh, uh, my interlocutor said that what Islam can offer is like music and the arts. I think what Islam offers is the truth. Islam is the truth. It is the religion that has been revealed uh, by God for the guidance of humanity. And that's something that we should discuss. This, these are the kinds of topics that should be uh, discussed in media in calm, rational, uh, you know, measured ways. And, and I'm willing to discuss my reasoning for uh, why Islam is the truth and, and reasons and justifications and arguments for that claim. And that's something that I encourage others to investigate as well. And when we t come to those parts of Islam that conflict with the modern world, we have to take a more academic perspective and we have to understand, well, what are these practices in context of a kinship based society? Prior to the nation state, what happened is that the nation state structure uh, within the beginnings of the 18th century and throughout uh, the next 300 years was to um, was a structure that was characterized by bureaucracy by technocratic industrial industrialization and by the enforcement of law through a very strong police state, surveillance state. And what the effect of all of this was to destroy uh, kinship based systems of life and living. And, and so what do I mean by this in, in societies in the past, kinship structure meant that every aspect of life flowed through the structure of, of the family, the extended family, family businesses. You didn't have corporations. You didn't have a banking, a, a global national banking system. All of these kinds of economic activity, social activity, even governmental activity, education, child care, uh, elderly care, all happened in context of the extended family. What the state did was destroy all these kinds of You're relationships really and institutionalize them. You're not really responding to the question. No, I am responding because I have to get to that, okay. that point. Wait, you're running in a time. Wait, go on, go on. Five. All right, so if we understand that everything that uh, the modern world has a problem with in terms of Islam, it also has a problem with all kinship-based societies. Um, let me address, um, for example, child marriage. Okay, the, I, the idea of childhood is actually a modern concept. It's something that if you look at the anthropology of childhood, anthropologists will note that the idea of childhood is something that's very new, only less than 200 years old. And the idea is that when you have a kinship-based society and you have a certain um, lifespan, then children are expected to be contributing to the family. They're expected to contribute to society and to their community because there's not an, a career that they're pursuing. There's not a need for a technical education that extends for 12, let me, 14, let me interrupt 16 just a second. years. I pause, I pause a little. Let me interrupt. Yeah. So you think that um, having sex with a nine-year-old is justified? Yeah. I mean, the thing is that the uh, so here, let me ask you a question. Okay, is the problem with no? Uh, how I'm asking no, you a question. Let me how, ask, well, I have to frame it. Okay, so if you have, do you have a problem with child marriage uh, because you think it is categorically wrong, or is it because it's conditionally wrong? Well, I'm asking you the question. How well, I want to understand it? what your understanding is because I think that the Prophet, peace be upon him, his his marriage to Aisha was at nine years of age, twenty one. Uh, so do you think that, that, I don't think that that's wrong. I can explain it and justify it. And I'm trying to give you the entire anthropological <laughs> explanation and the historical explanation of that. But like I said, it can't be done in five minutes. How about so we do that I, I, want, next I want to simplify it and say, do you think that this is categorically wrong or is it conditionally wrong? Categorically wrong. Like there's okay, no so situation. if you think that it's categorically wrong to have those kinds of relationships, do you think that other kinds of sexual behavior can be categorically wrong? 
as long as it harms somebody, as long as it no, if you mention harm, then it's harm not categorical. Cons- it's yeah. conditional based on no, no, harm. Yeah, but the but the category that you're introducing is a category that will be harmful in all situations in that category. That's how why can you, be, how can you if you specify that conditions? Would be a, then that, it's conditional. It's okay. not categorical. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. Um, I, you didn't really answer the question. Yeah, because I wasn't because you want me to bring up like why. You want me to explain why it's okay, why it's not okay to have sex with a nine-year-old? Like in a particular you... social context, in a particular uh, historical milieu. I mean, to me, that is... yes, it can be more, something that is moral and it is acceptable. I can agree with you and say that within this particular context, if you take a nine-year-old who is still watching, you know, Dora the Explorer, and it has, you know, that kind of cultural background in the situation they were. That's wrong. That's morally wrong. But you're asking me about a completely different social no, circumstance and society. Not that's not true. Because and I, child marriage, as you describe it, I Aisha think was the, playing, child, I the word child is anachronistic. If you're talking if about you child want to talk about that, that's something that was practiced throughout history yeah, and no, across I, all, all religions, across all cultures. And so the problem that you have is not with Islam. It's not with the Prophet Muhammad. Ooh. Peace be upon him. It's a problem with all of the past. I condemn you condemn uh, all of the past. Uh, all that's the problem child with modern rape. I condemn them all. And if you t- if you're thinking about the child mentality being different in different situations, remember that according to the hadith, Aisha was pr- playing with dolls uh, right before Muhammad raped them. You have but, thirty-five year olds who play with dolls in this day and age. They're Star Wars fans, Star Trek fans. They yeah. have action figures. They play with them. That's okay, so you can rape them. It's not rape, okay? Oh, you just okay. throw around the this, word rape like, whenever you okay, want to, okay. or terrorism, <laughs> willy-nilly. What I don't take the serious academic analysis. If you want, we could dedicate another five minutes just to that, if you want, after this. But I have other questions for you as well, but let me reset this. Um, what um, you, you mentioned that this is something we need to talk about. What the Muslim world need? What does the Muslim world need right now? The Muslim world needs to realize that now we have uh, extremists uh, who are graduating so that from, from like, Harvard. No, let's not do that. Right? Let's before, not do that. Before they used to Please. dress in uh, in uh, long, uh, sh- uh, well, basic Islamic tradition like this, and you can identify that this is a guy who holds a certain ideology, but when he speaks, you can then understand where he's coming from. Now they're dressed in the suits and ties, uh, yeah. and, you know, they, they come to university and try to academically uh, justify... Uh, that uh, marrying a nine-year-old, although I don't believe it happened, because in my book, I prove she was not nine. Although, I, I, look, we may disagree. I believe there was an even greater tragedy that the Muslim world is trying to hide and the fact that she was not a virgin and she was an obscene woman. But we're not discussing her, Aisha. We're not discussing her. We're discussing the fact that you believe that it's okay to marry a nine-year-old because society is different. Society can develop and change as many times as it like. Marrying a nine-year-old will never be right. Don't give me this lunar year, uh, whatever nonsense they come up with. Um, Muhammad did not marry a nine-year-old. This is a lie. Yes, other nine-year-olds from Muhammad's family were married off. Yes, I I agree. Other children uh, were married off to companions. I agree. Muhammad himself did not marry a nine-year-old. This is a lie to hide a bigger secret. The fact that you try to purify Muhammad's image by pushing the the age of his uh, wife back to six or nine or 15. You can't even agree on what age because she wasn't a child. She was uh, old and she'd slept with half of half of Mecca before him. Uh, and, and people can disagree, but this is my analysis and my proven research that I challenge anyone to refute. It's in my book. Um, uh, and I'm happy to pull out her timeline now and prove to you that she, she could, impossible, she would have been nine years old. Uh, and also the timeline is in, is in the book that I just released. Not so, according to Sunni Islam though. No, not according, according to Sunni Islam. 
I mean, according to Sunni Islam, she was nine when no, she. No, not all Sunnis. Not all Sunnis. It's in Bukhari. Believe. It's right yes, there. Yes, Bukhari is not the only Sunni scholar. But that's a Sahih. That's yeah, a sahih. there are many other Sahihs. He based his justification on the Quran not being perfect on Sahih Bukhari because a goat ate. A page that the Quran was written on. So how is that well, consistent? You're that, saying that. So you, you guys want to talk Sunnis, about the issue because I asked the, a different question. No, wait. Don't go back. I'm speaking to you based on your belief system. This is sacred to you, and the Quran is sacred to you. No, Sahih Bukhari is not sacred. It's not sacred anymore. The te that text is just a compilation of uh, narrations. They exist in many different texts. Okay. So do you emulate these because they're holy doings? The Quran and the Sunnah. Okay, the Sunnah so this can is a be sunnah. compiled in different uh, books. In PDF, in, in yeah, books. So of yes. course it's Sahih. Of course I, I study. I'm speaking and about content. Book. He's talking about paper and, and cardboard. I'm telling yeah. him Bukhari. He says it can be compiled in different formats. All right, but this is no, they're different. There's not <laughs> just Sahih Bukhari. Okay, okay. There's the, Sahih okay. Muslim. She was nine Sahih, according to most okay. Islamic school of okay. thought. Yes, according to the majority of Muslims, she was nine. Yes. And uh, accepted Islamic schools of thought, yes. she was nine. Yeah, when to, she was, to the majority. Yes, okay. to the majority. But not to all. Uh, now, moving on with, with my time, uh, it is absolutely wrong whatsoever. I don't care what people say. He can give it an academic coating, all what he likes. Uh, completely wrong. It can never be justified. Uh, no way can it be justified that marrying a nine year old is right. And these laws that you have in certain American states that allow uh, a man to marry a child uh, without uh, her parents' consent, or uh, 11 or 10 or 12, I don't know, there are numerous states. That's also wrong. That is also wrong. And, you and, also disagree and, and, with yes, I do. Uh, eleven year olds going on having girlfriend, boyfriend, ten yeah, what year about olds, nine year olds, yes, having, about having sex at the age of nine with their yes. boyfriend. You agree with that? I I, I reject it. I don't allow. You don't that. think elementary school children should have boyfriend, girlfriend? No, I don't. And have sex with each other no, because that's rampant in Australia, the uh, U.S., I, the U.K. I condemn it because it's in Australia. It doesn't mean I agree with it. Okay, so you condemn. So what's the line? When is it okay do you for know, people to do start you, having sex? Uh, do you know who, what what age? I'll is it tell okay? you now. But do you know who brings these uh, uh, children, uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, my body, your body things into into our educational system and sex ed? Do you know who? Your allies, the allies of the Islamic extremists, the leftists, the globalists. They are the ones. I'm not who aligned with you. leftists. No, they are aligned with you. They would love you. They no, would be they denounce at, me every no, no, day. No. Yeah. They would love They denounce you. me and call me all, the same kind of things that you call me. No, 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 no. All right, Leftists my, don't my, like no. my question was completely ignored. Though. What does what the Muslim world? What does the Muslim world need right now? I said the Muslim world right now needs to okay. be warned from people like him. Okay. Yeah, the no, Muslim world, according to some, needs the white savior to right, come let's and give you colonize five. and enlighten the Muslims and teach uh, the Muslims. The okay, this is your five minutes. What does the world? What does the Muslim world need right now? The Muslim world needs for the West to leave it alone. That's what the Muslim world needs. The Muslim What's world needs for the uh, cessation of this kind of intervention and war and sanctions and intervention that has been taking place for over 200 years. That's what the Muslim world needs. The Muslim world needs to reject agents of Western powers Can who you prove are it? going to... Can you prove I'm an agent? Maybe one day Academ I'll, I'll Can prove you? Uh, maybe, maybe one day, yeah. Can you Let's prove keep it? Keep hiding your books. Let's no. just continue the question. Can you prove it? See, you just prove did what? that again. You can you prove I'm an agent? No, I'm not claiming that I can prove it. You, then I'm why do you say it? Based on the kinds of things that you promote. And like the kinds what? Of things you say. That Islam is a tragedy. That oh. all Islam can offer the world is Did I say Islam art, was a tragedy? Did I say Islam was a that tragedy? That the Quran is not perfect. That did, there's wait, no... wait. Armin, wait. Did I say Islam was a tragedy? It's the title of your book. The tragedy of Islam. It means Islam has a tragedy. And it's Islam you people. A tragedy. And it's you people. Yeah. So you could have said that the tragedy with Muslims today. No, not necessarily. You need to yeah. ask me what does the title of your book mean, and I would explain okay. that the tragedy really of interested. Islam is people like you. Now, can you prove I'm an agent? No, I'm not going to say that. No, you're not exactly. So don't say it. I didn't say it. I say no. Imam you, Tawhidi no, is an no, agent. Look at him. <laughs> Look, no, I like do not a coward say that. now, cowering. Yeah. You said agents like, and now you say I don't. I'm not I saying you're an agent. You know, yeah, I didn't say that you are an agent, but all right, go with your five minutes. Look, this there is are this is his type of people. You did when he, he, when they this are. This is what you did. You when, pointed at him when yeah, you said the word agent. Yeah, yeah. He's they calling can't. me a terrorist, dude. Of course, he's calling me a terrorist. I, I never called you a terrorist. What can be? Look at where I, we are. I did not call you a terrorist. Accusing someone of being a terrorist. I didn't call you a terrorist. Can have extreme ramifications for me and my family. I never called you a terrorist. We're living. We, in, we have uh, the tapes. Don't lie. We have the. I never called you a terrorist. You didn't call me a terrorist. I called you an extremist. Extremist, supporter, and lover of terrorists who named his son after a terrorist. 
Yes, yeah, and if so you don't like it, it's something very the ex extremely inflammatory to call someone a terrorist. I'm just implying that there are certain people who may be getting a uh, stipend, a monthly paycheck from certain kinds of sources to say don't the kinds of things that they say about Islam, yeah. and don't about terrorism, and you cannot and prove so it. If Can you, you can't prove it, don't imply it. Yeah, don't. Let's focus on the question: What does the Muslim world need right now? Do you think you answered that? Or so you... I, I, I uh, mentioned the biggest issue that's facing the Muslim world today, uh, and it's something that's relevant. At, we're living in the Western world. I was born and raised in Houston, Texas. I've lived all across the United States, um, uh, and this is what I think the Western world needs to hear: that Muslims should be left. Uh, without their, without meddling, intervention, warfare, Muslims do not need to be saved. Um, all of these justifications that are used uh, to attack and colonize uh, the Muslim world and to suppress Muslims, uh, this is the biggest cause of bloodshed and deformity within uh, Muslim society is this kind of Western intervention. So I do think that that's the biggest issue that needs to be addressed. I, mean, I, I agree also that to a certain extent that uh, Western intervention does destroy and demolish uh, the Middle East and it does give rise to extremist groups who then the other governments will come and find useful to fund them and so on. Wasn't, isn't Western intervention what is responsible for ending slavery in the Islamic world? Uh, correct. And also... Uh, Wait, what are you referring to? I'm talking about the uh, British uh, Empire forcing countries under its um, rule to end slavery. So the British enslaved the Muslims, and then that. Well, we have different definitions of slavery. Well, you could disagree. But you don't think that colonization and imperialism let, let, is a form can, of slavery? No. No. Wait, can, okay. <laughs> Do you at least think it's a bad thing? Um, yes. Oh, you have to think about. That. Or do you really think it's a bad thing? Well, uh, well on if, par with something that else that you think is really bad, like slavery. I well, no, I, I think well, there's some positive that came out of the British Empire of when a country that was the subjects. There were negative uh, aspects of it as well, but in uh, I think there were there are better ways of getting those ideas to the to other places than forcing countries to abide by them, right? But uh, there's um, I think. The imperialism is a. So you think I, hold on, I, let me let me finish. Imperialism, uh, every empire was involved in imperialism. The uh, Arab Empire, the Persian Empire, the Roman Empire, the uh, English Empire, the, Ch the Japanese Empire. That doesn't make it okay, but it does mean that it's part of what empires do. But that's not an excuse. Um, and the the countries that are are under these empires you, uh, change because of it. There are some positive changes, there are some negative changes. But whatever positive changes uh, that were that came from these empires, probably if could have been achieved in better ways, maybe if it that doesn't have to necessarily be through, um, you know, because if if a country with superior values uh, has another is ruling over a country, country with inferior values maybe there's going to be some positive interaction there but that doesn't mean that that's okay right how that, can you let, rule over a country without right? violence that's what i'm saying there are better ways okay so how and can that, you influence a country without violence well do you think that they can just, let, let me, the let british me, empire should distribute leaflets no you well yeah that's what i do i mean not leaflets but by through intimate i mean spreading that like the british uh, the european uh, values itself didn't came from somebody enforcing it on them. They came up to the realization. Imperialism that and colonialism does mean it was imposed on. That's them what I'm force. saying. There are better ways. Just like Europe came to the conclusion that these values works, there are better ways of encouraging these uh, these values to how? other places. But that's the question. That's what I'm. That's what. How is what my do, I'm doing for my my entire life through activism. But another point is that the British Empire obviously did some very very. Uh, nasty shit, nasty stuff. But uh, compared to other empires before it, it was a mild version of uh, the crimes that they committed. Like, but anyway, just want to answer your question. Of Bangla, of I want to answer your question. Of oh, I didn't like say they didn't. Three million. But let, yes. let him ask. Let him ask. With regards to intervention, yeah. okay. I, I agree that uh, you know intervention needs to stop. Um, it's it's terrible. We haven't seen anything good from. Uh, uh, you know, Western governments in interfering in Iraq or Afghanistan or Syria. Um, but I do believe that we need to uh, take a look at the different types of interventions. Don't forget there's a large ma 
large minority of people within the Middle East that do want America to come and save them from their government. And we see that in the protests and the chants that take place recently in uh, the Iranian uprisings. Uh, there, there is a large group of, of Muslims, uh, even though there are small countries such as the UAE and uh, so on, Oman and, and Kuwait, they want relations with America. Uh, they love uh, the British. They, their rulers have homes and, and uh, castles and uh, amazing uh, properties in, in the Western world, and they come regularly. Uh, even theocrats, they send their children like the Iranian regime to study in America and uh, you know, gain uh, citizenship. So uh, there is a level of intervention that is actually welcomed by the Muslims in Muslim countries. Uh, and that basically means come, bring your trade, bring your economy, uh, you know, bring your art, bring your, what goods do you have, take our carpets, take, take you know, let's, let's have this uh, ongoing relation uh, with, with the Western world, no problem. And there could be some sort of intervention as well when it comes to counterterrorism, when it comes to national security, there should be a level where Western governments and their intelligence services uh, should be able to interfere in the countries of other people in order to prevent a terrorist attack. Now, um, I did not plan on, on mentioning this, but I have to. Uh, the Israeli Mossad recently uh, went and notified the Australian government about a terrorist plot that was going to take place. Uh, I think it was in an airport or an airplane. And uh, the Australian government... Uh, was very open about this. It was all over the media that, hey, there was actually a government that had somehow intervened in our situation. Um, and the same happens with the British uh, and uh, the, the Americans when, you know, Australia uh, had, uh, you know, throughout its history, uh, many governments tried to come and take over and then you've had intervention. So when it comes to military intervention, we need to differentiate between a different, uh, between in, uh, moving to the Middle East in order to destroy it, bring out its government, establish a government that we like, and then, you know, uh, take its resources and riches and so on. I don't agree with that. However, there are interventions that the people themselves want. There are good and positive interventions. And, uh, you know, when, when a government comes uh, from the West, what we see now, it, they influence the educational curriculums, uh, Many students from the Middle East can then travel and, you know, vice versa. They travel to each other's countries. So we, I, I will not wipe out intervention completely, uh, but rather I see it as a big platform uh, and, and, uh, and a big, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, it's a great way to pave the way for nations to have relations with each other as opposed to just governments having diplomatic relations with each other. Uh, so I will not rule out intervention completely. I don't like the corrupt ones only. The, the, uh, may I go to the next question? I want to ask you about modernity or else you, un, unless you wanted to add something to this because I want yeah, to... Yeah, just a small point that, to add is I think that uh, if you think that having spies and intelligence services within the Muslim world is an acceptable form of inter intervention, I think that is uh, quite outrageous. Uh, the CIA, for example, has been involved with overthrowing uh, democratic governments in South America, in the Middle East as well, replacing democratically elected leadership and installing dictators who would rule with an iron fist, brutally suppressing any kind of dissent in order to support Western powers and Western interests. So, you know, if we're saying that the CIA and spy agencies, Mossad, like this is a good presence in the Muslim world, I think that this is outrageous no. and First ridiculous. Thing, I did not yeah, say they Muslim always, world. They always, said this is my time to talk. Counter-terrorism. Counter they, they all claim to be counter-terrorists. I agree with you. Even George Bush, he uh, invaded Iraq and killed a million people at least, uh, innocent civilians on the basis of fighting terrorism, okay. the global war on terror. So if that's going to be uh, carte blanche for any kind of involvement, then no, I don't agree with that. You can justify anything on the basis All right, of counterterrorism. I'm going to move on to the next question. And this is going to be my last question. And after you, you both answered he it. He won't allow me to. He, he makes points I need to respond to. Okay. Can you, you want to move on to I didn't another? even get a full five minutes. You just cut me off. No, because you said you wanted to just have something Then he wants small. to respond. So I should speak for a full five minutes so that he has more to respond to. <laughs> 
No, I finished my you point. Finished. No, look, I, I agree with Quick what he one said. Minute, I, one I minute. definitely agree. I definitely agree that certain people can uh, justify or certain organizations can justify anything by using uh, throwing around the word counter, counter-terrorism uh, and also uh, applying funding through that route. I, I completely agree. But I genuinely mean genuine counter-terrorism efforts. That's the ones I support. Other disguised issues I have no concern for. Uh, I completely oppose, uh, you know, Bush and what he did to Iraq, my people. I mean, I completely, I'm against it. My family were killed. So I'm completely against it. I I genuinely meant the real counterterrorism efforts. That's right. And I agree with you on the other points. Okay, this seems a a point of agreement. So let's move on to the next point. What are the problems with modernity? This is something that you wanted to make sure I bring up. So maybe you go first and then we'll see what if the mom agrees with you or not. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, the problems of modernity are so extensive. I already mentioned the main problem of the dissolution of uh, kinship bonds, the destruction of the family, the destruction of uh, communal uh, authority and communal connection. Um, These are all things that have arisen due to the uh, force and and the violent force of modernity. I think another big uh, negative and, and destructive effect of modernity is the loss of meaning that people have lost meaning in their lives they feel like there is no purpose because you know we don't believe in god we've been secularized we don't believe in a communal religion we don't have a connection with our families because our you families... mentioned these. do you want to add like new specific examples because you already touched on these ones yeah so i mean look at the institu- institutionalization of child care, education, elder care. Look at the average person's life. You're born in an institution, in a hospital. You're immediately taken and put in, put in a nursery. You're immediately then uh, taken home for just a short period of time before your mother has to go back to work. Uh, therefore, you're put into daycare. You're institutionalized apart from your family. You reach a certain age where you go to a, another institution, the public education system. Uh, where you spend the next uh, 12 years of your life, then you leave your family and go to another institution, then you go into the corporate world, another institution, you work your whole life, you retire, you don't have any family uh, that you have any connection with because you've spent the vast majority of your waking hours at institutions working. And then you're, you have to be put into an elderly care facility because you know no one has time to take care of the elderly so even at the end of your life you're institutionalized i mean one of the greatest tragedies is that you have uh in the suburbs of the united states and i'm sure in australia too i know that it's definitely a problem in western europe and the united states people who die in their homes and they're not found for months they're just rotting in their chairs in front of the television because they don't have any family to check up on them and ask them how they're doing Uh, come visit them. They have no, their children have been alienated. Their siblings and extended family have been alienated. And so they just rot in their chairs and they're just discovered when the smell reaches the neighbors. And this is such a problem that even in in Japan, it's, it's really has reached epidemic proportions because there's entire companies dedicated to the removal of corpses within apartments and homes because they have such a problem with rotting uh, elderly who they're retired and they're just alone uh, sitting at at home in front of the TV or in front of their computer and and they pass away without anyone noticing until the neighbors smell the corpse. So I think that's the perfect image of what modernity is all about. Um, I would say that uh, fascism, I mean, fascism is a product of modernity because when you take out religious meaning and religious significance, People, humans naturally need a higher purpose. Humans naturally need a higher purpose to organize under. They need a kind of hierarchy. They need a kind of communal bond and to feel like they are part of a greater cause. This is something that religion provides. And this is something that in 
throughout pre-modern history, you had kinship societies based on this shared understanding of God or the divine and the sacred and all of the kinds of relationships between people in a family and within a community was predicated on this kind of larger meaning. You wipe out that meaning, you destroy religion, and there's a vacuum. And what do people fill with that vacuum? Uh, Ultra-nationalism, ultra-jingoism, where uh, we have a white identity, we have a white nation, um, all kinds of fascistic uh, sentiment is developed out of this vacuum that's created by the destruction of religion because people are looking for meaning in their lives, they're looking for purpose and modernity, uh, it's liberal secular nature, it's anti-theistic nature is what has created um, room for fascism to grow and thrive. And this is a product of uh, the nation state and the way that it's structured in its opposition to the kinds of kinship relationships uh, found within traditional societies. And a specific example, look at the laws in uh, Western Europe now. They're talking about how it is child abuse to teach your child uh, a religion, a religious uh, tradition, because you're indoctrinating your children. So this is even that kind of influence, that kind of relationship between a child and his parents uh, to be able to teach a religion. The state wants to intervene and say, no, you cannot. OK. Um, all right. So the mom and then I think I'm, I'm going to respond to this question myself as well uh, for five minutes after your five minutes, because I need to talk about modernity. OK. Um, mine will be very, uh, very simple. Uh, I do share certain uh, conservative values. Uh, I believe in them, and I, I strongly believe in, in, in family, and I believe that uh, the government itself should never have the authority to tell a father what uh, he can and cannot uh, teach uh, his you know, child or a mother her child. And uh, I'm speaking in general, not certain uh, exceptions, because we do have... Uh, families that do raise extremist children and this is when we need a stronger force and in most cases that force is the government that then comes and takes care of uh, of such uh, indoctrination and the uh, raising of extremist children for instance taking them to extremist mosques taking them to fundamentalist schools uh, you know taking them abroad holidays excursions where they meet radical uh, uh, imams who uh, you know uh, do what they do over there, all these atrocities. And uh, I believe, and you know, we saw with the wave of all these parents that went to join ISIS, took their children along with them. Um, this is a problem. I mean, when you have a father that takes his, his, uh, his son or, you know, takes his daughter to Mosul to then have them hold heads of, of uh, extremists, I believe this is a time, a perfect time for the government to intervene and say, listen, you cannot be teaching your children this. So having an eye out or an organized uh, uh, society that uh, keeps an eye out uh, on children and also elders, I think it's a good thing. Uh, but I do not, uh, I really don't agree with the nine to five uh, issue where the father is out from the home or the mother is out from uh, the home and uh, you know just uh, ha having a, a society where the human being is, is away from home I believe that takes away from the value and goals of family uh, that that are part of human nature so I agree on, on that issue and uh, I think that that's the only point I wanted to make only when it comes to family I saw a tweet that was very interesting recently where someone was saying, you know, is, is my only purpose to work, pay bills and then die? You know, is that all that life is meant to be? And, and I talk to, you know, friends and different people, you know, I go to the grocery store and I'll, I'll meet people and talk to them. And there's it's, it's very sad how depressed people are. Um, given the situation that they're facing with their children, like someone was telling me that, you know, I never get to see my daughter. She's 13 years old now. Uh, she comes home from school. She just has a smartphone and, and looking at that, she plays, you know, Fortnite, this uh, kind of video game, uh, eight hours a day, and then she goes to sleep and, and that's right. it. And then I go to work and I... there's no there's no meaning to that kind of existence and people recognize that. I, I think I... I think also the viewers, uh, those that have 
been raised in such a society will not sort of understand why I'm agreeing with you or why we're, we're somehow agreeing with each other because we've lived it. I don't agree so with you too. We, we've lived uh, the, the fact that you come home and there's a father and there's a mother and so, ha so have our parents. So we know what's missing in this society. But I guess that will open up another topic of integration and, uh, and so on. All right. I'm going to quickly um, answer this. I'll try to stay in the five minutes. Um, I think you, you two are looking at a much shorter trend compared to what uh, looking at the entire history because uh, you mentioned families and be, people being separated. Um, I mean, we, we live in an age where we don't worry that much about the mom dying at childbirth. This was um, the mom surviving at childbirth used to be an amazing, great thing. It wasn't that it, it, mothers dying from childbirth used to be very common but they're not anymore. Uh, children get to grow up seeing their mom instead of, you know, uh, you mentioned uh, working. We have constantly have to work. Well, throughout history, people constantly had to work. The difference is that they had to constantly work to be able to eat and not starve to death. Now they're constantly working to be able to afford a TV or a better house. I think I take this over that any day. Uh, you, you guys mentioned about being away from your father, being away from your family, uh, not spending time with them. We're living in an age where your work and where you work maybe one hour, you know, 10 minutes, one hour, two hours away from where you are. People used to go to war. You didn't know if your husband is going to come back. People used to be trade when they go do trading. It would be a six month, two year, 10 year uh, before they get, get go, come back home to see their family. That's what the norm was. Um, you, you guys talk about rotting, uh, elderly rotting in the in places and people don't I notice. Think the war them. was an let, exception. Let me. War was an exception. No. It's not the norm. War? No. Fa mm. Parents going to war. No, I'm saying that even that if they exception. don't go to war, they go, if they go trade, if they go sell yeah, stuff, okay. that was that was a common job. But they, they would, they, the amount of time that they would be away would be okay, years. Okay. Uh, you're talking about um, elder, the elderly rotting in their chairs. Well, if. If they're elderly and given the standards of history, they're lucky that they managed to become elderly because that was not the norm to reach age, ages of 70 or 18 before you would be lucky if you managed to reach age 50 or 60. Uh, you're talking about having a higher purpose. The, the problem is that religion actually has monopolized giving people purpose. If you look at a lot of countries without religion, people are, do, are not... Uh, sensing a lack of purpose when you when religion doesn't have monopoly the, there's a many different options for providing people purpose obviously other than religion there are other bad ideas as well not religion is not the only bad idea but if you people point to communism and other bad ideas that is not religious to say all oh, religion is uh, the, the better better option here but just because there are other bad options that doesn't mean that religion is the only alternative religion has monopolized uh, obviously people do require a sense of significance they desire a sense of purpose they desire a sense of community desire to be uh, feel me a sense of meaning uh, but all of this uh, has been offered and can be offered in a much mo more efficient and modern way based on a better understanding of human psychology and many um, uh, atheistic Scandinavian countries where there is no absence of religion. We don't see people jumping out of windows and committing suicide because there are many other options, many, be many better options for people to find a sense of purpose, a sense of sig significance. Um, and you mentioned fascism and white identity as a result of uh, religion, l lack of religion. Uh, if, it, if you're talking about fasc fascism and white identity politics, this was also uh, part of the norm in human history. Like the Persian Empire, the uh, the Roman Empire, uh, the Mongolians, the Chinese, they didn't have democracy. They they also were fascistic government that uh, with an, uh, religion was the norm there. Fascism was also a part of, now let me finish, but also this white identity. The Romans thought that they're, they're the superior race. Everybody else is a barbarian. The Persians thought that they're the superior race. Everybody else is a barbarian. So th these kind of ide identity politics, the kind of fascism that you're referring to, was a norm throughout history. In fact, we, we are seeing it less than ever before. And that was my defense of modernity. So can I respond to that? Yeah, and I'm going to just let you, I'm not going to respond to your response, whatever your response is. But after you respond to that, you, I'm going to let you to, if you want to add anything at the end, if you want five minutes to add anything that you think you wanted to say that you didn't get a chance to say, you could add that as well. So respond to me, but then we'll, we'll take your last statements as well. 
So I just wanted to respond to uh, the points that you made, Armin, about um, the continuity between pre-modernity and modernity and some of the things I mentioned as being a problem with modernity. One thing that I always found interesting about the books, uh, 1984, you know, George Orwell's 1984, Aldous Huxley's A Brave New World, is that they pointed out a situation where the vast majority of people within a society are happy and they think that they're living fantastic lives and they feel satisfied in every single way, but in reality, they're living in a nightmarish dystopia. And I think that that is a very stark uh, and profound message for people in the modern world that we might experience things as being not so bad and in fact, very uh, pleasurable and ideal in many different ways. But nonetheless, it is a, a dystopia that we are occupying. And so you want you made a couple of distinctions uh, that I think are worth addressing. You know, I don't have any doubt that there are many negative things that happen within pre-modernity, many negative things that might have happened in Muslim history because not all Muslims were following Islam uh, with throughout history and even to this day. But I want us to understand the bigger trend and the bigger uh, impact that modernity through the use of technology, through the use of nationalism and the coercive power of the police state, the surveillance state has had on the modern person, the modern human, human beings condition. And yeah, you, you can mention all of these negative things with the past. And if you have a purely utilitarian conception of what human purpose is, then you can bring about the most good, very simply, just put all human beings in vats and hook up their brains to a kind of simulation, like in the matrix, and just feed them, you know, pleasure through the brain or maybe through drugs, and they will be in a constant state of bliss biologically. And yeah, you can have that kind of world and you can have that kind of set up very easily. It's within technological capabilities at this point in time. But is that really the kind of world that we want to live in? Is that really the type of future that as any human, Muslim or non-Muslim, is that the kind of future that we want for ourselves and our children? To me, that seems like the complete destruction uh, and annihilation of human beings and of the human uh, condition. So I don't agree with you that... Um, you know, the kinds of things that we see in the world today existed in the same kind of uh, manner in, in pre-modernity. The kinds of the kind of atomization and institutionalization, which I refer to, is something modern and no doubt people worked in the past. But look at the kind of work that's expected of uh, people today. People work themselves to death. I don't know a single person who works a nine to five job that is that has never had a complaint uh, with their employer that has never felt used and abused by their employer. And this is why unions are formed. This is why you have political movements on the basis of employer employee uh, rights. So there are many things that we can point to. Fascism, yeah, I have no uh, doubt that there are ethnic identities that existed throughout human history. Were they fascist? No, because a part of fascism, what a central component of fascism is uh, the nation state, which did not exist uh, in the past. The bureaucratic nation state did not exist prior to the 18th century. And then also technology, the ability to enforce a kind of surveillance and authority um, from the top down to control people and 
force them to live in a certain way and abide by the nationalistic government's authority, that totalitarian uh, kind of government did not exist in pre-modernity because you didn't have the technology, first of all. And then also one characteristic of fascistic regimes is that they seek to obliterate other cultures and they seek to uh, destroy uh, other cultures than the dominant nation nation's culture. But that's not the case in Islamic history. That's not the case in other and even Roman history. It's ar arguable that what the Romans did wasn't to obliterate uh, the different cultures that they ended up ruling over and dominating. They just kept those cultures subservient. So in ways that the culture disagrees or conflicts with the Roman uh, mandate and Roman law, then those are the aspects that need to change. Everything else uh, is left alone. And Romans didn't have this kind of uh, project of dismantling those cultures in the same way that imperialists and, and liberal, secular, technocratic colonizers and imperialists have, uh, have uh, unleashed upon the world Muslims, natives, First Nations, and so on and so forth. So there's a there's a big qualitative distinction there that characterizes modernity from uh, from uh, pre-modernity. As a, as far as you also mentioned, like people in the past would also die and, and they get old and die and rot. Um, yeah, that's true. I'm not denying that people died in the past and and became old. But were they alone? Were they in front of you know a television set in their apartment by themselves and not discovered for for three months that was just a symbol of of the uh overall condition that we're suffering from in the modern world I, well i mentioned that they would be lucky if they got to get old but anyways um so now we're gonna just uh, let the uh, imams say anything that he might have wanted to say that he didn't get a chance to and then we'll do the same with you and that would be the end of it okay there was just uh few things I wanted to uh, mention uh, with regards to your question to me which then the brother uh, commented on my answer you asked me whether Muslims what can Islam contribute uh, to society humanity the world and I said that Islam contributes basically what all other religions can contribute all re all religions can be interpreted in a negative way and can be interpreted in a positive way and can be utilized in a specific area or field within human history and we've seen religions evolve in order to serve human history so islam is no different it can be made violent it can be made peaceful the same beheading that takes place as a legal sentence in Saudi Arabia is condemned and frowned upon in Kuwait, in Muslim Kuwait. So there are uh, many uh, aspects that we could explore when it comes to what Islam can offer. No, no different from any other religion, can be used in a good way, can be used in a bad way. Yes, that was the first part of my answer. Now, the second part which needs clarification, is what can Muslims contribute? And I said that Muslims can contribute in art, in education, in music, in all aspects of life. And I elaborated on that previously, but I think the brother misheard me and said that I had said that Islam can contribute to art and music and that Islam should actually contribute to the truth instead. That. So I just wanted to clarify that Islam does not contribute to art and music. In fact, art and music are very limited and sometimes even banned in Islamic law. It is Muslims that can contribute to society uh, because they are, of course, better than the fundamentalist teachings that uh, they've been uh, born into. Um, another matter that you spoke about is that I cancel out the hadith and you said, how do we know what existed before, previously? Uh, and that if we cancel the hadith, then we can't basically know what existed before. No, I say we need Bukhari. We need Tabari. We need these extremist fundamentalist books. We need them. We need the books of Khomeini. In a hundred years, I would be against someone banning Khomeini or banning the uh, Shalmagani or banning the uh, uh, early Shia fundamentalists. I would be against it. I want their books to remain so we can see exactly what happened and not be like them. 
if we ban these books completely, I would ban them in universities, I would ban them in libraries because I don't want my child to end up doing a research and being influenced by it. Uh, I don't want it to influence curriculums, but I would want it to be accessible for the public to see what a tragedy this is. So I, I'm not advocating to ban books. I'm saying we, we learn what happened, what the development of Islam was from these books, but we do not, uh, but we don't abide by them. If it says butcher and kill, I'm not going to go butcher and kill. And then that's not how I see it. Uh, another issue is that uh, the brother said that we, if you believe in Islam and if you believe in it to be true, then a Muslim would spread the religion of Islam because they believe it to be true. Uh, firstly, we need to understand that religion came to serve humanity, not to serve Muslims or to ser or, or to to serve God. Okay, religion does not serve God. Uh, the way you you framed it is that if I believe in God, and if you allow me a bit more time, if I believe in God, and if I believe in God's message is true, the the Holy Quran, then I need to teach this book and spread it. Okay, this is wrong. This is serving God. Religion was not sent down to serve God. Religion serves me. <laughs> yes, to, to worship. No problem. But that is not the purpose of... Are you telling me that your purpose is only to pray and pray to God? Worship that God. That verse is addressing all of humanity as a whole. Yes. Their purpose. Uh, no problem. So you can... But you're uh, saying the opposite. You're saying that no, the no, purpose no. of humanity... Is not to worship God, or not to serve God. Did not say Oma Khalaqtul Muslimin. All humanity. I know that's my point. <laughs> exactly. This comes from a context of God wanting to serve. I'm an Imam. I serve my religion. Why? Because it serves humanity. The, my organization. I believe in serving humanity okay. as well. My organization. Part of serving humanity is to inform humanity yeah. of their Creator. My organization right. serves humanity, so I serve my organization. I don't serve my God. My religion is here you don't to serve, serve me. God. No, my religion is here to serve me. You don't care about serving no, God. No, the moment the moment religion wants to kill and butcher, then we go against that belief system. Uh, religion needs religion when it emerges. What does it say? We are here to make your life better. We are here to make you better people. They're here to serve us. Prophets are are, are, are servants of humanity. We 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 don't serve God. God doesn't need me. God doesn't need me to to worship and and go uh, you know promote him. He does. He has. A, he's a king. He has everything. He's an atheist. That's a good point for you now. <laughs> no, God doesn't need me. Why am I here serving God? I don't need it. That's why all caliphates and theocracies are, are corrupt. And that's why Muhammad never had a government. Now, yeah, I think you're outing yourself. Uh, com coming back to a, uh, a another matter, which is very important. You get the same amount of time. Yes, sure. which is very important. Uh, when you were speaking about violence. You said that a society cannot live, cannot function without violence, and that society does not reject violence. And, and then you, you spoke about how police enforce the law, use that term, enforcing the law, because it has some sort of a, of a violent, uh, uh, violent feel to it. Uh, no, we were speaking about Islamic terrorism. Terrorists don't have a law. ISIS came in Iraq, and the, would you allow ISIS to use the same... Uh, understanding of, of violence that you you, you uh, spoke of earlier, how you said that uh, you need to enforce the law. We need violence in society to make sure that everybody uh, falls in line. ISIS did the same thing. They took over the same way all governments take over. At one point, someone took over some land and then constitutions were established. So did ISIS. They took over Mosul and they brought their caliphate. So what now? Because they have a law. And they have a law that you can't do this, otherwise we'll chop your hand off. You can, a taxi driver can't charge more than what the caliph allows, otherwise we'll behead him. Mannequins need to wear burqas. What? Because they have a law, and they enforce the law by violence. That means it's okay? No. And in Saudi Arabia, they behead people by a violent law. Does that mean it's okay? This is very wrong. Just because violence is given the terminology of a law, or is considered by a group that it's a law, it does not make it right. You cannot justify this, otherwise it would apply to ISIS as well. ISIS would turn around and say, we're an establishment. The people clapped for us when we first came in. And people love us. There are many who come from around the world to fight for us. And we have a law. And we are terrorists. And you know, let's, let's do what we want. It doesn't work like that.
So before before you start, can you mention what Quran verse did you say in Arabic and what's the translation for the people that don't know Arabic? Which Quran verse was it? Um, I think it's in Surat al dhariyat Okay. Um, I'm not sure. The, it's a very uh, famous verse. What's that's the what translation? That, what's means. the trans? Can you give the translation? It means I. This is God speaking. I did not create uh, jinn and which and humans except to worship me. Okay. Except to yabudun. And this is not Muslims. This is all humans. Yes, in, mm -hmm. meaning in uh, in sand, humanity. Right. So all all humans are supposed to worship Allah. That's the, that's the yeah, because we are we belong to God. God has created us, and we are in a position of being a creation of God. And so, part of uh, our purpose is to worship God and to seek the truth and to uh, be believers in our Creator. All right. So and to avoid that and to be uh, apart from God is going is to hurt us in this life. It's going to lead to many kinds of problems that we can discuss. All right. Your points. Seven minutes. Okay, yeah, so I want to just uh, mention some of the points that we kind of glossed over and we didn't get into really uh, the details. So I want to clarify that the point about uh, there's hadith regard in Sahih Bukhari regarding uh, the goat eating a certain leaf, uh, which the, a certain verse of the Quran was written on. Yes, this is something that you will find in uh, Sahih Bukhari. But the Quran was not transmitted through paper and pen. Uh, we didn't get the Quran like through a USB drive that has been perver pres preserved historically. The Quran has been recited. It's a oral tradition and it has been memorized from the, uh, the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, in, in his lifetime. Not just one, two, three, but dozens. And they taught their students. And so the the... Uh, recitation of the Quran and, and the uh, standard recitation of the Quran has been preserved throughout history through this method of memorization and authorization through Sanad. And so this is one of the greatest achievements within uh, human history of an intellectual tradition that is able to preserve itself through a system of authorization, Isnad, and um, recitation and memorization and so forth. So this is we're talking about the epistemology of Islam, which is important to study and understand, and even non-Muslim academics will recognize this, and that's why today you have hundreds and thousands of Muslims all over the world who all recite the same Quran. It's not because the Quran is not preserved because it's written on a, in a certain uh, on certain pieces of paper. It's preserved because it's an oral tradition. But it so that's so that's the first point. The second point about the satanic verses, this is an issue that's going very deep into the weeds of Islamic scholarship, but there are differences of opinion on whether this uh, whispering of Satan to the Prophet, peace be upon him, um, certain verses, whether this is authentic, whether it actually happened, Muslim scholars disagree. So this is something that we should be aware of. Some scholars like Ibn Taymiyyah uh, um, said that this is actually proof that uh, the prophet, peace be upon him, was a true prophet of God. And this is, incident uh, is arguably referenced in the Quran itself. Um, when uh, there's one verse of the Quran where Allah says, God says, and we did not send before you any messenger or prophet, except that when he spoke, Satan threw into his speech some misunderstanding. But Allah, God, abolishes that which Satan throws in. And then Allah makes precise his verses and Allah is knowing and wise. So this is something that the Islamic intellectual tradition had no problem whatsoever in explaining and, and justifying. And it's not a attack on the uh, or it's not a successful criticism or really a compelling criticism of the coherence and, and the preservation of the Quran. About capital punishment, again, I asked if you are a pacifist or if you are in disagreement with uh, capital punishment. I, you know, I'm from Texas uh, and we... Uh, we do have capital punishment as the law for people who are committing heinous crimes, uh, serial killers, um, people who are uh, mass shooters, who are killing many people, who are causing all kinds of destruction. And this is one of the types of things that capital punishment should deter. 
And so I think that there is a, uh, you can easily argue for the moral defensibility of capital punishment. Now, if you agree on the defensibility of capital punishment, like many Americans do, and see the logic of that, then it doesn't matter how that is taken out, whether it's with lethal injection, which is arguably very painful to have uh, poison pumped into your veins, or the electric chair, or beheading. I mean, this is something that I don't see any kind of moral uh, problem with. It's just something that uh, people like to bring up as if it's some kind of gruesome act, but I don't see it as inherently more gruesome than any other kind of capital punishment. Uh, so that is that point. And I had another point that I wanted to make. Oh, violence and state coercion. So this is there's a very interesting and compelling statement from a Harvard Law School professor, I believe Duncan Kennedy, who said that Every time that lawmakers make a law, this is another opportunity for violence. This is another opportunity for violence. And this is uh, explained pretty uh, shockingly with an example of a parking ticket. For example, there are laws against parking in certain zones within a city, within a metropolitan area. How is parking uh, laws, traffic laws, an opportunity for violence, state violence? Well, if you don't pay, if you park in one of these prohibited zones, and you get a ticket, what if you decide not to pay this ticket? Well, the court can decide, uh, the magistrate can decide to put a lien on your house, meaning that they can foreclose your house because you have outstanding parking violations that you haven't paid. When you have a lien on your house and your house is foreclosed, that means the state can sell your house in order to recoup its money. And so they can, the state can sell your home, and if they do so, they'll send a sheriff to remove you from your home so that the new owners can move in. If you refuse to move, the sheriff can use force to arrest you and take you out of your home, pull you out of your home. If you res resist that, the sheriff has the authority to use deadly force against you. So this is how even something like parking violations is an opportunity for violence. And that's why the modern state is the most violent state the modern state is the most violent state because look at all the laws that are restricting and controlling human behavior. What a human, even how a person can walk across the street. If you jaywalk, okay, and this is not theoretical. There are many examples of police brutality where the police officer will go to the African-American who has jaywalked and say, well, what are you doing here? You're uh, violating of the law and the african-american will say or a hispanic or other minority well i was just minding my own business i didn't realize that this was a problem and they'll be violently detained and even killed so this is something that is characteristic of the modern state and the proliferation of law after law after law controlling how human beings can live their lives this didn't exist in the past okay. you didn't have this kind of bureaucracy if you look at books of fiqh if you look at islamic law it can fit within a, a manual, you know, a, a small text. Whereas if you look at the legal code can of I any just, given contemporary that state... Up, can I just quickly sure. comment on that? Because you're comparing... First of all, it's interesting that you're, uh, you're comparing uh, what's supposed to be God's perfect law to human law and pointing to fault in human law as a, as a way to excuse exactly. God's law. And another point is that you th that step-by-step -step process that you're talking... You're saying... Party the point was about no, violence, right? Okay. The, uh, violence is something that we should reject. Yeah, but, and so I'm pointing out that the, if we have a problem with violence, then the modern state should yeah, be the focus of our critique and our denunciation. Because no, the modern nobody, state is more violent than any other first, uh, nobody, social organization that has existed Nobody in here defends everything modern governments do, do, right? And second of all, even with the examples that you give, you, you compare that step-by-step uh, parking ticket and then going through all the steps that you said you're talking you're comparing that to a religion that teaches you that if i say hey i changed my mind i don't think muhammad was the prophet of god you agree that the punishment for that punishment for somebody like me is death according to islam do you agree with that yeah i've gone on record uh saying that apostasy uh the punishment for that is very clear in islamic law and there's all kinds of regulations based on that. It's not about vigilante violence and Muslims going and And that's uh, justified down according to you. you think? Within an Islamic state, okay, a proper Islamic state, Within legitimate Islamic, Islamic state, yes, hmm. it is morally, uh, it is a part of Islam, first of all, and it is morally defensible to say that those who leave the faith 
should uh, will face capital punishment if they don't um, so renounce their. So you think their killing me under, under a perfect Islamic state is justified? So if you were within an Islamic state, legitimate Islamic state, and you, what would happen is that you would be detained, okay, for announcing your apostasy. And there's a good reason for this. Just like we have laws that sanction certain kinds of thoughts and certain kinds of behaviors. Like, uh, for example, Holocaust denial. Uh, within Europe, for example, it's illegal. If you go and start denying the Holocaust and saying that, yeah, we need to... Uh, be neo-Nazis and we need to support Hitler and we need Let's to focus on this. No, no, this is very relevant because that kind is just a thought, right? It's just an idea. Yeah, to I deny the Holocaust is just an idea, just like renouncing Islam. I, I don't support banning that either. But, but okay, so yeah. you, you don't think that but Holocaust focus should be banned, but look at the effects of that. Look at the effects on society. You have a society that's more conducive to accept anti-Semitism. You have a society that's they're imprisoned, and if you refuse to no, no, go, no. you refuse Do to be imprisoned, killed? you can. Uh, is is the first are authorized to killed? use deadly force? Yeah, no, no, you're not answering okay. my question. Is denying the Holocaust in those European areas something that constitutes an immediate court verdict for one's beheading, stoning, or killing? In Islamic law, it's not no, a no, no. immediate uh, stoning, is. beheading. No, it it's is. Not. It is under some schools of thought, they say, go and try and convince him to come back to Islam. Under yes. some. Not under Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, not under ISIS. We've seen the videos. But Look, I'm talking about traditional Islam. I don't, I don't endorse ISIS what ISIS is traditional Islam. I don't Islam. endorse what ISIS is. Let's not go, ISIS back. Is okay, let's not go back to that. We're not going back. Yeah. But I'm, I'm very surprised by his answer. No, but you didn't let me finish my answer. Let's so in, in terms of Holocaust denial, People generally, maybe not Armin, maybe Armin is fine with a society full but of Holocaust. But forget let's talk about Islam. Let me finish, let me finish what I'm saying. It's what about Maybe Islam? Armin is okay with a society of Holocaust deniers and anti-Semites and neo-Nazis coming into power and organizing. Maybe well, that's I did not that, say that, come on. I did not say that. So you think that they should be broken up, neo-Nazi shouldn't have the right to self-assembly? They I, shouldn't have the right to, you know, have rallies. If you look at in, in, in Germany, they were banned and there's a rise in anti-Semitism in Germany. So no, banning no, their voice is not going to help. I'm, I'm very confused. Yes. No, well, I'm let me very explain. confused. You let know me, why? Let me explain. Because, please explain to me how, how, how the who point, gives the point you the is, right? The point is that certain thoughts, we should all agree that certain thoughts are very noxious. Okay. Certain thoughts are very dangerous. Okay. Okay. You're, you're constantly talking about counter-terrorism, okay. right? Yeah. So there are certain extremism, as you call it, that society should uh, uh, punish or prohibit that these kinds of we ideas don't. should not be... Why? Because we don't want a society full of anti-Semites and racists and neo-Nazis. By killing them? No, no. We, we prohibit those kinds of expressions of ideas through the law. And similarly, and, Islamic and law says that apostasy, leaving Islam, is something that is so damaging and so dangerous and causes so much harm. Where does Islam say that? No, no, that, no, that, what was his conclusion? Me. He was saying that, that we need to do what? It's so harmful that we need to do what? That we have to have high penalties for it. And what is the penalty? In the, the penalty? same way that What is the penalty? Death. The penalty is you are, uh, someone is, uh, you know, taken by the authorities in question. Like, did you actually renounce And then Islam? I say yes. I say yes. What yeah, happens? so then you have three days to change your mind. And if you insist, then it's a death penalty. Death penalty. During these three days, they're already preparing your... your Just your like funeral. if you if you right. go to Germany and you say, I'm a Holocaust denier. You get killed. They will say that, okay, yeah. this is against the law. We're taking you do to prison. You? And then you say, no, I resist. And do then they they'll ki kill you if you resist that. Yeah. No, 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 if you, no, 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 it was not this the same. Islam this guarantees the, the death if you resist. Germany does not guarantee death. Maybe they kill you, you, maybe they don't. Hey, that, you don't have to be in Germany. You can be in any uh, country. No, if, if you resist the police's mandate, okay. they this, have, they're authorized uh, to use deadly force. Uh, no, because that's the not the police, same. Kill you. Wait, so you're saying because the police have the right to shoot, right? Have the right to shoot, then the Islamic Caliph has the right to behead someone for leaving the religion. Is that the, what you're saying? The point is, let's focus on the point, is that certain ideas... Do, we, let's get come to a consensus. They don't have the right to deadly force Let, to unless consensus. we actually let's cause harm. To consensus. There are certain ideas that are so dangerous. I mean, we can have a debate on whether leaving Islam is dangerous or threatens a person's well-being, threatens a community's or a nation's well-being. We all assume 
Okay, we all agree that Holocaust denial or for anti-Semitism, if that was prolif proliferated throughout society, this would be a bad thing. Just the ideas, just the ideas or racism. Uh, so we kill them. Pro if that proliferated through society, that would be bad. Do we agree on that? Do you think that uh, right, right, white right. supremacy? Yes, it's bad. It's bad. Okay, so should there be laws to prevent that? To prevent should there be it? laws that no problem, but you so don't kill. So, okay, so laws so, are okay. So, it's so then we, too we're much drawing candy. the lines in different places. You think that it should be enforced? Laws should be implemented. Okay. No, laws should be no. implemented, and then you, you are comparing fire? two different things yes. that have nothing to do with each other. You are comparing a man-made law in Europe regarding hating certain ways of thinking. Yes. You're comparing that to the justified law of God of beheading anyone who writes a book like this or leaves the religion. Answer me. Who gives you that right? And again, the comparison is not, the, is not at all the same. I, know. This is the same. I, I just, you just would answer all, me, please. You just accepted that you would endorse laws that restricted certain ideas from spreading. <laughs> Human beings don't okay. have I'm God. In agreement. You're in Listen. complete agreement with Islamic yes. law because uh, Islamic no. law has laws I, you, that you need prevent to understand. the spread of certain ideas. Let me, let me. Human beings don't so what's have the difference? God. Explain Human to me. Beings, explain to me I, the I'm explaining. Human because beings, you agree with one set of laws. I'm, I'm explaining. But you have a problem yes. with Islamic law. So I'm saying these are two are the, the same laws. Kind of the laws we have here are man-made. We vote for the laws and we elect our leaders. No, this you is can't on vote. a human level. On a human level, these laws cannot be compared to Sharia law that comes from God, that nobody can question. The law you are referring to in Europe can be debated, can be cancelled can be uh, made void and can be objected, right? The law of God can't. If Armin is killed, he's done. Nothing can uh, undo that. Now, I have a question. So you answer me. Hitler came to power through democracy, Hitler right? is not a caliph. Okay. He came through, Donald Trump came to power through a democratic Donald election. Donald Trump can If do tomorrow Donald Trump says Donald that, Donald Trump is not doing it in the name of God. Anti-Semitism should be something that we don't right. have any kind of laws to... against or we don't have any sanctions you against can't justify. people who are anti-Semites. You can't justify human no, law with God's law. Explain you, to me. I'm like, explaining. You cannot justify human law with God's law. Now, I have a question. Uh, do you think that uh, Armin... Well, you do think he will be killed under an Islamic State. What is your evidence for that? I mean, this is was the consensus position of all the schools of Give thought. me one. Give me one. One name. One position. Give me one verse. Give the me. school of Imam Ahmad. The school of Imam Where Shafi, did he get it the from? The school of Imam Malik. Wait, who is he? I mean, they have their justification, such as the Prophet, peace be upon him, saying that if someone changes his religion, then kill him. Wait, show me. It's in, it's in Bukhari. Show me. Well, I mean, I, this is not even all of Bukhari. You no, only have like uh, three you, volumes. The Kitab al Hadud is here. The chapter of punishments well, is in here. You know it's in Bukhari. What's no, I, I know. Where did Bukhari get it from? This goes back to the. You deny all of these texts. So what? Show me from the Quran. That. I don't deny the Quran. But Islamic law is not just based on. The Quran, there's but many four hadood do. sources. M many of the hadood are yes, the many of them such do. as I adultery. Adultery. Yeah, can, can you show me the stoning verse sure that the stoning verse that the goat ate was in the Quran? Show me the other ones. Can I get some points in because you guys? <laughs> the point is, your beheading of people has no basis in the religion except that the fathers-in-law of Muhammad did it, and therefore you believe their appointment is well, divine. You said that you said the punishment for zina for lashing is in the, it's Quran. In the Quran. You don't agree with that. No, I don't. Yeah, because you don't think the Quran is perfect. So. No, it's not because I don't think it's perfect. It's because you said that's not perfect. It's because the verse is not is not uh, unlimited to to time right. and place. The the verse is limited. We need to we need, it's, I, yes, it's limited. We need to cut. Hold on. The, the verses in the Quran are theological. They're jurisprudential. And you cannot come and take a theological verse and say, yes, this applies to every place and take a jurisprudential ruling and say, apply the chopping of the hand. I'll ask you a question. A thief. Hold on. A thief. We need to go. A thief. Do you believe that a thief's hand should be chopped? No, 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 we can't get into that. We can, we can, I had to get some words One second. And we, and One second. I agree with all, all, all of the Hudud. I agree okay. with all the Hudud. Okay. Every aspect of okay. Islamic law. But so you have to have the, you chop, you the chop correct the hand. I really need to get this in. And they, you're running out of time. And I have few ten seconds. Ten seconds. I think if a lot you, of Americans if, actually if, would support chopping of the hands. Okay. When, if when you chop the hand, how do you pray? How do you pray as a Muslim? 
If you chop the hand, yeah, you can proceed it. No, you, you can't. Lying you can it's only proceed it when you cannot place it in seven my positions. Turn. My you turn. My it. You cannot right. pray without without two Th palms on the this, ground. This has to be. I'm making. I have <laughs> to respond to this. This is the last point. Uh, first of all, just rest restricting. Like just because we can, we want to restricting that doesn't that doesn't mean we want to kill them. It, if, if restricting and killing could be used interchangeably, if I said we need to restrict access, children's access to candy, you're like, well, why not just kill kids that want to eat too much sugar? You just, no, you no, just, no, no, let me no, I restrict you just because we are okay with restricting things. That doesn't mean killing is an okay a solution. Um, also, wait, um, you missed the point. No, You're no, misconstruing and, and, the argument. Okay, so in, in, in so another thing is that you have to understand the in, argument with, before you can critique it. Okay, just so I I, do, I won't I make started, my two other I points. I started with a point. I started with the point that we all agree that okay, there are certain yeah. ideas. Yes, but that the, that should be restricted. But they're different ways, such as racist we don't, ideas. That's not the point. The point yeah. is that I understand your point. My point is that you're focusing on an agreement that is obvious. Part, like obviously, some ideas need to well, be. Well, it's not obvious but, to neo Nazis. No, let me let me it's tell. Not no, let me finish. White supremacists. Obviously, we have to fight ideas. Some ideas we disagree with the method. The method of fighting ideas is what we disagreeing with. No, we agree. And killing because, is because not look, part. Killing. Here's here's what we disagree. Killing should not be part of. Uh, the solution of fighting bad ideas. I don't know. That's people, all. People have. We are out of time. Um, but give one last one, one word, one word. Ten seconds. <laughs> well, the thing is that the implications of what people say when it comes to racism or uh, misogyny, they desire to in, have strict sanctions and strict penalties on racists, white supremacies, and anti um, sexists. And we see that played out in society. Like some of the uh, Donald Sterling, the owner of the Clippers, he expressed in private racist views. What was the reaction? There was extreme re justified reaction against his racism that ended up lo him losing uh, his ownership of the Clippers. He, right. he faced many kinds of social consequences that are in line with loss of life. We have, uh, we have Sorry, that was right. good. Thank you so much. Yeah, it, I mean, I, this is something that I discuss in depth on, on my website. And I mean, well. don't get killed, man. <laughs> yeah, okay, so thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Do you guys want to shake your hand? Of course. All right. And where, where can people find you again? Uh, at Imam of Peace on Twitter. Where can people find you? They can go to my website, muslimskeptic with a K dot com. And I'm on social media just using my last name, Hayratu. You can find me and I have de more detailed arguments because you can take some of the things I say and uh, make them look extreme because there's not the larger academic discussion about right. uh, the context of these very complicated, nuanced issues. Go to his website because his last name is impossible to figure out how to spell. But yeah, yeah website. Persian last name. Okay, so we did, we did touch on, on a lot of important stuff, but obviously all of us wanted to... Uh, touch on some topics that maybe we didn't get a chance to um i think these are topics that we might want we might want to review this and see where we could we move forward from here i think even though maybe we, we all of us were unhappy with some parts i think overall that we got a lot of content out of this and a lot of good information i think everybody got a chance to express at least a lot of the views that they wanted to express yeah. so i think overall this was this was really good so th thank you so much for all of thank you thank you for having us armin thank you very much thank you yeah, thank, thank you, you. We are creating this content independently. We rely on fan support to be able to cover all our costs. If you are a fan of this type of content, please support us. There are a couple of different ways that you guys could support us in the description. Uh, these kind of content do cost money. Uh, we, have to, we have a lot of expenses to cover. Uh, if you want uh, this kind of underground uh, investigative content where we go into community into the communities we talk to different people with from different communities and their leaders uh, and ask them firsthand and you know ask them the questions that you know the that you know we're good at uh, please consider supporting us but we do need we need we really do need your support to be able to continue with this project <laughs>